I don't know if you guys can see this, but that says 5.50 a.m. And I've already been up for like an hour. I realize I always come at you guys with like a ton of energy in these intros and like, I just wanted to show you that sometimes we get a little nervous, wake up super early and wander around the house forever. At least it's pretty for Christmas. Sipping coffee and hanging out with the dogs while I basically just wait to play in this game. I'm gonna go try to be super active and get these nerves out and go try to look pretty real quick and I'll see you guys at the table. All right, you guys, got my hair done. We're here, ready, running a little late as usual. Gonna go break my chips into smaller chips and get ready to play. So pumped. Today's game is a 2550 all vlogger stream here on this very fancy WPT stage at the win. We're in front of an entire ballroom of people playing the side events and today's lineup is gonna be a fun one. That's why I'm nervous. That's why I'm up early in the morning. So excited. Adrenaline is pumping. In the commentary booth, we've got Jeff Platt and Caitlin Kameski. They're hilarious and you'll hear from them throughout the vlog. The very first hand of the stream, Andrew Nimi, the godfather of vlogging himself opens the lojack. We're in the big blind with king nine offsuit and don't try this at home kids, this is not a peel, but I came in here feeling a little bit extra frisky, I guess, and decided to make the call. The flop comes out queen nine four, so I flop middle pair. I've got that sneaky little heart going for me too, but once I check it to Andrew, he quickly checks it back. The turn is a six of diamonds, so I could consider starting to bet now just to protect my nine against a lot of draws that are out there, but a lot of the draws that I would be protecting from would have probably bet the flop as Andrew. So I'm not really worried that much, and I'm just gonna take my showdown value by check calling and then deciding on the river. So I check and Andrew bets turn for 175 bucks. That's about two thirds of the pot. We're gonna continue with the plan though, even though he sizes up, I'm gonna call this turn. The river is another four and same thing. I'm just gonna check and kind of decide. Andrew checks back and when I declare a nine, he says, you're good. And while I didn't see this in game, he did end up having a six of clubs. So it feels really nice to be dragging in this little icebreaker pot right away, especially against the guy who is the sole reason why I'm standing here doing this voiceover right now. Not long after that, I pick up the best hand in poker and raise it up under the gun. Yeah. Boston Jimmy, who I didn't know anything about before this, makes the call directly to my left. So heads up, we go to a jack five, three, two spade flop. I've got the ace of spades. And normally I would be checking a lot from early position against early position. And honestly, I think that's what I should have done. But in game, I chose to bet. I went a third of the pot for $125 and Jimmy makes the call. So we've got him on the hook. Let's see how much we can get out of him. The turn is a king of clubs. And now with a double flush draw on board, even though I kind of block both of the nut flush draws that he could have with my aces, I decide to size up on this turn. So I go $425 on the turn and Jimmy snap folds his hand, which happened to be pocket deuces. So those uh, pre-flop rages that we're talking about where there's no ante, yeah. Throw those out the window because that's not happening on a live stream. As you can see, people are a lot looser than uh, all those charts that we study at home. All right, still settling into this game, I pick up a six of clubs under the gun too. Lynn has straddled to a hundred, so this time I raise to $250. Andrew makes the call and Lynn defends her straddle. So three ways that we see the queen, nine, three, two club flop. That's right, there are four green cards out there. We've got two of them. This is a good place to start. Lynn checks it over to me. I'm gonna start out with a bet here. I bet 275. Andrew quickly folds and Lynn comes along. The dealer puts out the three of spades on the the turn and I'm not gonna lie, this is not one of my favorite cards. Lynn is not known for being a folder. She could definitely have a three, but even if she doesn't, she's not gonna be folding a queen or a nine on this turn. She wouldn't fold a worse flush draw as well. So there's that. But once she checks it over to me, I think that this is a clear check. So I have no idea why my hand starts reaching for chips and bets $700 on this turn. 
She quickly makes the call, not feeling great about it. The river bricks out for us at seven of diamonds. She checks it over to me. For the same reasons that I probably should have checked back the turn, I try not to compound my mistakes by bluffing three streets on this river. So I just check it back. I don't want to get stationed off by somebody who's known for stationing off. And she flips over a queen. It does have a pretty bad kicker. I might have been able to get her off of it with three barrels. So not feeling great about this hand, but moving on, seeing if I can settle in and turn things around. In this one, Cedric opens under the gun plus one to $150. We peel with sevens on the button. The flop comes out queen six four with a flush draw. Cedric bets out 125 bucks. And on this board texture, if I had to guess between zero and 100% of how often he would be C betting, I would be much closer to 100. So we're not going anywhere with pocket sevens. And the turn is a dagger right through my soul. It's the ace of hearts. Way better for Cedric in this spot, even if he was bluffing on the flop, he can definitely have a lot of ace X or flush draws that get to this turn, but he decides to check it over to me. So with my pair of sevens, with the heart, I don't really see a reason to bet this turn and turn it into a bluff. So I happily check it back. The river is a magical seven of clubs, giving me a very sneaky set on the river. And now's the time when Cedric decides to pull the trigger and bet $425, which is two thirds of the pot right into me. I have a very disguised trips hand. I don't think that he has a flush very often when he just checks the turn. I mean, Cedric is a great player and he's really sneaky sometimes, but I think that he also just likes to put money in the pot. So he most likely would have put money in the pot with a flush on the turn. So I have to weigh my options about the times where I'm value owning myself, where he did get sneaky with a flush and decides not to call me off. But the version of me that was playing this game decides just to call. Oh my goodness, what was I thinking? If I had to break it down, what I was thinking in game, this is what it was. I checked back the turn. I really capped myself at not having flushes very often, at not having two pairs, etc. So against a player like Seti who can sniff that out and hand read pretty well, I thought that raising this river would just open myself up to being three bet bluffed. But that is so fancy. That is so hard for him to have to pull the trigger on. And I just was giving him so much credit for being able to own me by not raising. Said he ended up having ace five of clubs going for some thin value on the river. This hand most likely wouldn't have paid me off if I did end up raising with my set. But when you're evaluating your play, you got to think about the entire range of hands that he could have had. Better ace X's do fall into that range of hands that would have paid off a value raise. So not happy with my decision here. But after that seven's hand, I gave myself a pep talk. You guys know the one, that mid-session update where you're kicking yourself and telling yourself I am going to play better. I was having that talk with myself when this hand happened. The straddle is back on in this hand, so I open ace three of hearts up to a little larger sizing to 300. Jimmy is in the hijack. He's been a thorn in my side, really active. He's taking advantage of people post-flop with lots of raises, etc. He makes the call. So we go heads up to the beautiful ace, six, five, two heart flop. So we flop top pair, nut flush draw. And this is the exact type of hand that makes a great check candidate. Obviously in these two positions, like I said earlier, when I had aces, these two positions as the out of position person, you want to check a lot. And having an ace and two hearts in my hand, I'm blocking a lot of the hands that I want Jimmy to have to call me with. So it makes it even easier for me to check. Jimmy decides to throw out a bet of $275. Obviously we're not going anywhere. So I toss in the call. The turn is now the eight of clubs, bringing two flush draws, some potential straights. Although I don't know how often he's peeling nine, seven, but if anybody's going to peel it, it's definitely going to be Boston Jimmy. I check it over to him and he continues now for about a half pot size bet. So I make the call. The river is a seven of hearts and Caitlin in the booth says exactly what I'm thinking. Money. I check it over to him again because if the man's got value, if he's got a bluff, he's gonna be betting either way. So we wait for his decision and music to my ears, he puts out $1,400. That's usually what I buy in for in my regular cash game. <laughs> Obviously we're gonna be going all in, which Caitlin is a big fan of. Put it in, put it in, put it in. Yeah, girl. <laughs> and because Jimmy showed up with Queen Jack of Clubs, he's not gonna pay me off. He did indeed have a bluff. 
off. He snap folds, but I'm still really happy. We finally got there with a flush draw, but more importantly, I was finally happy with how I played a hand. Obviously, this hand's not rocket science, but it does feel good for your confidence to at least play one pot correctly. With my stack trending in the right direction, I looked down an ace-queen offsuit from under the gun one. I raised it up to $150, and Boston Jimmy just cannot get away from me. He three bets to $450 to go. We're a little deeper stacked now, so when it folds back around to me, I have a decision to make. And normally, at a lower stake game that I'm comfortable at, I would be four bet buffing this. And you know what? That's what I decide to do now. I make it $1,200 to go. I think that Jimmy has been super active, and if there's anybody I should punish, it's gonna be him. But I'm not gonna lie, my heart is racing because I really don't want to play this giant bloated pot with this offsuit ace out of position against a guy who is this active. Who's your Disney princess you now? Spoiler. He immediately lets it go, and I'm feeling good now. Momentum swinging in my direction. I feel like I'm actually executing what I know to be the right plays. And with that, we go on break. For the security of the stream, they lock our phones in these little lock boxes that are off the stage. So I wasn't getting any updates about hands until we went on break. All right, quick update. I gotta get out of here real quick while they do something on the stage. We've been playing about two hours. Just got a little text update from coach who told me to raise a little smaller and not peel so wide pre, I guess. So <laughs> that's the update from him. And um, yeah, I've just been really fun time. I don't know, I'm feeling great about all the people that are here today. It's always fun when you play poker with people who are talkative, who are fun, who are just there to like talk, nerdy talk about poker. So yeah, that's a little mid-session update. And we get immediate fireworks right after break. Seti opens under the gun to $150. Lynn makes the call and I look down at pocket aces once again, this time from the hijack against the two most active players at the table with a deeper stack than I had to start the stream. Uh, it's a dream spot. So I make it $700 to go and Jeff says, Ashley and Cedric could absolutely collide here. Just what I'm thinking. Folds around to Seti and he four bets now to $2,800. Lynn is out of there and I only started this hand with a little more than $7,000. So this is almost half my stack. If I'm gonna continue, I'm most likely gonna be ripping it in. So that's what I do. I jam it all in. Cedric quickly makes the call and asks. The call and Once here we twice, go. Ash. <laughs> so yeah, we decide to run it twice and the first board comes. Ooh, but it comes king, wow. king, queen. <laughs> yeah. Even though I got a smile on my face, you guys, inside, I am devastated. This does not feel good. Brings me back to the old glory days of losing against quads. Anyway, the second board at least runs out clean for me. We end up chopping and all I can do is think about what might have been. 87% of the time I would have $15,000 sitting in front of me after this hand. At this point in the night, Kitty Kuo has arrived, fresh off the plane from Taiwan, she said. And she's getting in the mix, being quite active. And in this one, she three bets Johnny's open to $450. I am in the cutoff with Ace King of Spades. I know Kitty is really active in general. And when I am to her direct left, my aggression factor is probably going to go way up. So obviously when I actually have it, I'm gonna be doing the same thing. So I four bet and then Conrad comes out of nowhere from the small blind and goes all in for $4,150. Not much more than my four bet. But before we pass over this spot, look what Johnny's about to snap fold, pocket queens. Yeah, so all of this action, I don't blame him. I'm four betting, Conrad's five betting all in. Johnny doesn't even think twice about it. He just insta mucks his pocket queens. Honestly, I don't really feel great about it either with Conrad five betting all in, but his jam is not for that much more. So I call and we opt to run it twice. Luckily, I'm up against ace king off as well, same hand. And even though I do flop a free roll in the first flop, we don't get there. We end up chopping it up. Johnny would have made quads, so I'm sure he's kind of kicking himself, but I honestly don't blame him for the fold. It looks really, really strong. It just so happened to be like the absolute bottom of what Conrad and I would be doing this with for value. 
<laughs> this game is thoroughly off the rails. We've got Kitty Quo hitting on Frankie from Next Gen Poker, trying to get a date with each other. There's like some chemistry going on, uh, a lot of dating talk. We have really gone off the rails and are having so much fun at this point in the game. Lynn opens the cutoff. She makes it 125 to go. And I defend my big with a seven off. The flop comes down ace, king, six. And surprisingly, she checks this one back. And the turn is the seven of spades. So we turn two pair and now I have a decision whether I want to bet or be a little bit disguised. I decide on a check because I think that Lynn perceives me to be on the tighter side and will kind of go after me if I slow play this a little bit. And I don't think that she would have checked back a lot of super strong hands on this flop or even some strong draws. I think in general, people would bet this flop a lot, cut off versus a big blind peel on the larger side. And if she did check back, it would be some sort of middling ace X or a king X holding some pair under a king that just has showdown value, but doesn't want to bet. And so for all of those reasons, I decide to check because I'll probably only get one street out of those types of hands. All the other hands she has are bluffs. So I think that I'm more likely to get value by checking this turn. There's 275 in the pot and she overbets $450. So now she's really polarizing herself and it doesn't quite make any sense because she checked back the flop. I'm putting her squarely on a bluff and obviously I don't want to raise against a bluff. So I just call. The river is another seven. I continue with the check and this time Lynn goes into the tank for a little bit longer and decides on 400 more dollars to go. Really tiny bet size, which Caitlin likes to call. Little tickle. Like I said on the turn, I really didn't think she had much because she checks back the flop, overbets the turn. Now she's sizing down on the river. To me, this really made no sense, but I still have to go for it just in case she played something a little bit tricky. I go for value with a $1,400 raise. Unfortunately, she snap folds and that's because she has 10 Hi, you guys. <laughs> so it felt really good because the turn decision to check and only call made me 800 more dollars. Okay, momentum swinging my direction. Let's keep it going. In this one, I open king queen suited in the hijack. Conrad makes the call in the cutoff and Cedric makes the call in the small blind. Quick note on Cedric at this point in the session, he is down heaps. So he just seems flustered. He is not happy at this point in the session. Anyway, the three of us see the king six four rainbow flop. Said he checks it to me and on a king high board when nobody three bet me in these late positions, I am heavily favored on this flop. So I'm gonna go stick out a little C bet of 175 bucks. Only Conrad makes the call and now we're heads up to the three of diamonds turn. I'm gonna continue going for value on this turn. So I bet $500 just sizing up. I do that very frequently on turn cards. Conrad thinks for, oh, about 0.5 seconds before tossing in the 500 chip. And the river is another six. So the board pairs, but I'm really not concerned about that. Yes, he could have a six, but if he does so, I'm gonna hear about it on the river. And in the meantime, there's a ton of King X holdings and potential worse pairs that might get curious and pay me. So I gotta go for some value. And in an $1,800 pot, I choose a $1,200 size bet. Conrad goes deep into the tank. He's super uncomfortable. You can see him, he's smiling at me. He starts making comments like, Here. Not a great feeling. So yeah, he's not feeling great about it, but eventually he says, and then puts in the calling chips. When I flip over my hand, it is good. He shows me that he had King Jack suited. So we got him pipped by one unlucky. Andrew had enough and left this game and is replaced by the wonderful Juan Liu. In this one, I open Queen Jack offsuit from the hijack to 150 bucks. Juan comes along and Lynn comes along in the big blind. Both of these ladies not known for folding. So we've got our work cut out for us. The flop comes out ace, six, five, all spades. We have the queen of spades in our hand. Lynn checks it over to me and I decide to check this one. I'm gonna be checking monotone boards a lot and having the queen is really a nice backup. Juan quickly checks back. So 
so we all see the seven of diamonds turn. Once Lynn checks to me for a second time, I decide to delay C bet and size up a little bit here for $300. Juan quickly folds and Lynn sticks around. She is not a folder, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to get her off of whatever she has by the river. So fingers crossed, but the river comes out a jack of diamonds. So now we actually have showdown value. When she checks it over to me though, I have devious thoughts of my own. I'm thinking, hmm, how often does Lynn have an ace here? I feel like she could have called the turn with a lot of pair plus flush draw or pair plus straight draw, like seven, eight or six, eight, something like that. She has been calling even fourth pair on turn. So I think that she could show up here with a lot of one pair holdings that have a missed flush draw with them. So I actually decide on going for some really thin value based on how she's been playing tonight. And now that I've had breaks and I've been hearing some feedback from Jesse about how how she's been playing. I've seen hands get to showdown where she's calling down with really bad pairs. Maybe she doesn't do that against me, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. So I stick out a bet of $450. Here comes the interesting part. Lynn thinks about it for a while and then she raises. Oh, this is really not what you wanna see when you're going for super thin value. She makes it $1,800 to go, putting me in the cage. This is just absolute disaster, especially when you could have just checked it back. Uh, eventually I decide that maybe she does have an ace that was slow playing two pair, or maybe she did make a straight on the turn, or maybe she was slow playing a flush the whole way. Yeah, I just gave her credit. Didn't think that my jack was good anymore, and I decided to let it go. And what do you know? Lynn had nine seven offsuit, you guys, with the with the spade in her hand. So she turns her seven into a bluff. She had the same idea as I did that neither one of us were super strong and she gets the last laugh in this one, absolutely owns me on the river and feels bad, feels bad, but I could have easily just tapped the table, drag it in a little bit of a pot. Yeah, losing this one did not feel great. Props to Lynn for absolutely owning my soul in this one. Very well done. Last hand of the night, you guys. And honestly, if you click away and don't watch it, save me the embarrassment, I wouldn't be mad at you. <laughs> All right, in this one, I open King Jack off under the gun, probably a little too light, but here we are. I open to 150. Johnny peels a small blind. He's been really solid all night long. Kitty, she's been playing a lot of hands. She peels a big blind. So all three of us see the 1083 rainbow board. When it checks to me, I decide to go for a bet here. I bet $150. Johnny Vibe says, I don't think so, and raises it up to $500. Just one little chip. Kitty's out of there, and when it's back to me, I flick in the call. Now let me pause right here for a second. In game, I remember exactly what I was thinking. I remember thinking, well, if I hit a nine or a queen, I make a straight. Now all of you hyper advanced poker players out there will notice <laughs> that is not true. That is not the case. <laughs> I have two overs and not a lot of else going for me. I could turn a straight draw. That's about all I have going for me. And this just goes to show playing on a live stream, 10X the stakes I usually play for eight hours straight has really, really gotten to my brain. And now I am in no man's land. Anyway, the turn comes the six of diamonds. And now Johnny checks it over to me. And here I am still thinking, all right, well, I have a nine or a queen that I can get bailed out on the river. I most likely have a jack or a king as well. There's no reason to bet and get check raised once again, as unlikely as that is, that's what I was thinking in my head. So I check it back and hope that I make a straight. And the river is the queen. And guess what, you guys? Once the river hits is when my brain snaps back and now realizes I will not, in fact, have a straight when a queen hits, because here it is, the queen is here and I do not have a straight. It was almost like I counted on my fingers, like 10, jack, queen, oh crap, I need another number. Like the most basic crap. I just cannot believe that this is what was going on in my brain. I'm really, really embarrassed about this, but this is what happened. Now that Johnny checks a second time to me on the river, I decide I have to go for a bluff. I really have to make something of this tragedy of a hand. So I fire out $1,200 on the river. Two things happened before this that made me think that this could work. One is that when I value bet river against 
Conrad and he called Johnny made a comment later about not being able to fold those rivers, but always wanting to. And then against Juan, he actually did fold the river and found out later on break that Juan bluffed him. So he is in that headspace of wanting to fold these rivers. So I thought that this actually might salvage this hand. Unfortunately, after he makes this comment. Ugh, I hate having a jack in my hand. Oh. oh, he sticks in the call. He's obviously right with his Jack 10 of diamonds. Oh my God. And you guys, this is just the, this is a prime example of it's time to go. Like it's time to pick up and end the session. Luckily for me, there was only a few more orbits that happened before we all decided to take a very extended dinner break. And that was it. That's how I ended the session. I texted Jesse right after this and said, I'm done. I'm not thinking clearly, I have to go. A lot of work cut out for me to improve from this moment. But if I didn't document these moments, I would not have as much to celebrate in the future when these moments don't happen anymore. <laughs> oh man. Man, that was a long stream. I think it played for like eight hours. I definitely got some brain fog towards the end. The positives of today, I felt really comfortable at the table. I felt really confident about the stakes once we got into it. It took a couple hours, but I did feel comfortable. It felt like such a good time. Like all of these people were awesome. Like I just enjoy hanging out with other vloggers. The downside was that I didn't get involved uh, once again in any like epically big pots and missed a couple of bluff spots for sure, which I told myself <laughs> at the beginning I would not be missing. So I'm a little disappointed that I missed some of those bluff spots. And I'm gonna go over that with Jesse, see if I can plug some leaks and figure out what's going on there because I'm not stopping you guys. I'm going to figure out how to get myself from where I am now to what it takes to be a crusher. Like, what is that missing thing? I'm missing something, it's there. Like, I'm so close. I basically broke dead even. I lost $25, which was one small blind in this game. In for 6,000, out for 5,975. But we had a great time, spent eight hours at a TV table, and I get to do it all over again tomorrow. Not playing, but this time, me and Poker Face Ash will be commentating the WPT ladies game. So that'll be fun, and I might even be able to hop in. You never know. So we'll see. I'll see you guys later. That's enough talking. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. I will see you in the next one. Coming at you soon. Bye, guys. Next on the vlog, we're playing a $10,000 buy-in WPT main event at the win. Tons of action, you don't wanna miss it. Uh -huh.